This is Coons Ford Turf Talk with Bruce Posner. 60 minutes of Maryland athletics and your phone calls at 410-481-1300. Now, here's Bruce Posner and Turp Talk. Well, the O's are in the wind column today. Great news, and uh, despite three errors, but uh, a win's a win, and it took a lot to do it over the... When you win in New York, it's a big accomplishment. But uh, we're going to talk a lot about the Orioles later on, as well as Maryland released its non-conference schedule. But first, a good friend of mine is coming on the show right now. He is the assistant coach of the University of Maryland lacrosse team. He's on the Bayhawks. But right now, he is a gold medal winner of the World Championship Games for Team USA. And that, of course, is Jesse Bernhardt. Jesse, how are you today? Bruce, how's it going? Thanks for having me on. Hey, it's my pleasure, Jess. And uh, let's talk about the World Games for, before we get into the other subjects. Uh, you were fantastic. but And Michael Earhart was beyond conception, and Jake was great. But you know what's funny? It was that, and I'm a little biased because it was a great team, but it was that yeah. Maryland ethos, that Maryland hard-nosed nature on defense that really triggered that victory. And you guys were fantastic in the way you shut down the, the stall offense without scoring. Well, I appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, you know, we were we were proud to represent. I think, uh, you know, we had five Terps on the team. So that was by far the most uh, of any college representing. Um, so we were excited to be able to do that. And, um, and you know, I think Coach Donowski and the staff, uh, you know, obviously did a great job of putting together, you know, uh, a team and not just collecting talent and they wanted a, a group of guys that uh, were going to play hard and, and be tough and you know fortunately for us uh, you know it's kind of some of the same things we pride ourselves on at, at Maryland so uh, you know to be able to have five guys out there and represent that uh, it was awesome. Now correct me if I'm wrong I, I think I remember seeing you absolutely decking Josh Byrne your teammate is that correct? Uh, I, I did get a little bit of a lick on him. I think I actually drew a, I drew a penalty for it. Um, so it probably wasn't legal, but I, I did get a, get a lick, lick on him. That's Jesse Bernhardt for you. Jesse, what did, what did it mean? Look, you've had wins everywhere. You've won with the Bayhawks. You won with Maryland. You've done everything in your life has been victories. But uh, this one has to have a special place in their heart with the way, uh, with the national anthem and the, uh, you know, at the end of it, defeating Canada and getting back the title for USA. Yeah, it was definitely uh, one of the best lacrosse experiences I've ever been a part of. Um, so, and, you know, to be able to, you know, obviously win, but do it for, you know, who who are representing, uh, to be able to do it and have, you know, Jake on the team with me and do it with guys who, again, are some of my best friends, um, you know, being guys like John Hoss and, and Mike Earhart and stuff, Um you know, and, you know, especially after what happened in 2014, uh, by coming up a little short, it was definitely a, a very uh, cool experience that I will definitely remember for a long time. Had to be great having Jake on the team. Uh, to do that with your brother is, you guys are close anyway, but to be able to achieve that goal with Jake, it had to be really special. Yeah, it, it was great. Um, you know, obviously fortunate to, to, you know, play at Maryland together, but really since then, uh, you know, we played on separate teams in the MLL. So to be able to get back playing in the same jersey as him and, uh, you know, for a couple of guys coming from Florida uh, to, you know, probably have, um, you know, be the first two guys from Florida to get on that team and then to be able to do it together. And, you know, I was able to, have, we were able to have our parents over there as well. So uh, it was definitely special. And uh, again, made, makes it even better for the fact that we were able to, you know, come out with the gold. It was really special and uh, very proud of you and all the guys. Earhart was just, he was unconscious in that series and deservingly was the MVP defensively. And, uh, you know, but he always has been that way. It's no surprise to me. But in, no. that, in that particular series, he was special. Yeah, he did a great job. And again, I mean, if, if you've been around him and you played with him uh, or seen him play enough, uh, again, to us, you know, not really a, a big surprise. And, uh, you know, he was having a heck of an MLL season before that. And um, again, he was kind of primed and ready to go, uh, you know, when the games came calling. And he just did a tremendous job uh, from scoring goals, but just picking up a ton of ground balls and just playing great defense. And yes, we're very well deserving of that award. When we get to uh, the Bayhawks, we're going to talk about Nico, but I have to tell you, I was so impressed with Galloway. Uh, 
His clearing passes, you know, I used to think that Jesse, that nobody could best Jesse Schwartzman with clearing passes. And I thought that Nico's kind of like in that category. But I've never seen him like Galloway was throwing. I mean, he was almost like a quarterback. Yeah, he, he does a great job. I mean, he is so composed um, when he's in the cage and, uh, again, very focused and uh, and yeah, man, when he has the opportunity to throw an outlet pass or kind of get out over the top, uh, you know, he throws the ball hard and he, he puts it, he puts it on your stick and, and he's looking to do it, which is, uh, which is, you know, the best part about it. There's no, no hesitation there. And sometimes even almost toeing the line, if it was a good or bad decision, but again, for, you know, for a defenseman like me, you know, we got to love that stuff. So. Correct. One of the few times I've ever rooted for Paul Rabel, but uh, I have to tell you that his game, when he the first game against Canada, he, I think he had one goal and four assists. Of course, it was the winning goal. He like took a new role and really like cherished it. He was unbelievable that game. Yeah, no, he did a good job. And, and again, I mean, you know, with, with a team you know filled with talented guys, you know, the ball wasn't going to be in any one of those guys' stick. Um, you know, the entire time, nor did it need to be. And uh, again, you know, give give credit to the coaching staff. I thought they did an awesome job of, um, you know, coaching us up. You know, it was, it was like being in college again and getting those guys to play on the same page, which is a whole lot easier said than done. But um, again, guys were able to kind of evolve their game and maybe take a step back um, from what they're used to doing to just for the betterment of the team. And again, I think that's definitely one of the reasons we had success. And again, he was a guy that was able to do that. And uh, again, at certain points in time, it was, uh, you know, it was definitely the right move. Uh, and, and, you know, and it was successful. You know, Jesse, uh, we'll move to the Bayhawks now. And of course, while you were away, they got their butts kicked by Charlotte. <laughs> and it was kind of interesting to see Rambo decked Amato, Nico. I saw that. I, I mean, give me a I, I said, it looked like he was hesitant about doing it, but he said, oh, what the hell? You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I saw it. I mean, hey, us Terps, we love each other, but hey, we're, we're also competitive too. And, uh, you know, we we like uh, you know busting each other's chops. So you know, when somebody gets a chance to uh, you know give it to another guy, whether it be verbally or, or on the field, uh, you know, it's part of the game. So Bayhawks picked up two great terps with uh, IDA and of course uh, Colin Heacock. Uh, I'm not surprised about their success. I'm a little surprised about how fast they caught on. You know, it takes a while in the MLL. Yeah, uh, I mean. Again, I mean, you know, we, we've got a handful of guys playing. I mean, Isaiah, obviously, like you said, Colin, Nick Manis is a guy who, uh, you know, that's been playing a lot. And, you know, I think based off of that national championship team with those guys was probably an underrated guy. And he's stepped in for us and he's been able to play short stick. He's played down low. He's played man down defense. Um, so, you know, with those guys. Uh, again, not easy. I mean, you're work, trying to work on a 19-man roster, um, so just to get a spot on any team in the league is tough. But, um, again, I'm biased, but I like to think, uh, you know, the kind of program Coach Tills runs and, you know, the competitive schedule that we play, um, you know, it gives guys definitely an upper hand that, you know, when they get to this level, um, you know, they're not afraid to compete. They're ready to compete. They know how to prepare. They know how to be a professional. And, uh, again, that's why I'm not surprised that those guys have done so well. Manis and Jake and uh, Burns, these are all guys who uh, just got kept getting better, especially in their senior year. And you see where they have developed to. I mean, Jake is one of the stars of the MLL. And uh, I, I always love Jake because I never forget the year where he had to sit out. Uh, injury or something, and yep. there wasn't a, mo- a guy with deeper heart for the team than Jake. And yeah, yeah, definitely. It was really, really impressive to me. Talk about Nico. Now, for Nico, his goal average, I think, is second or third in the MLL, and he's been really special taking over for Brian Phipps on the team. Yeah, he's done a great job. You know, Phipps went down with a little bit of an injury, and uh, and, you know, give credit to Nico. Um, you know, he's been very focused and, and done a good job in terms of just some strength and conditioning and getting himself getting himself in better shape and, um, you know, just knowing whenever the opportunity was going to present itself, you know, he was going to take full advantage of it, and he definitely has. Um, I mean, he's been playing great, you know, in cage and at times, 
you know, bailing us out, making saves, and again, making a, make, making a whole lot of them. So he's done an awesome job. And I think to have, you know, Phipps kind of as a backup guy and a little bit of a mentor, uh, I think it, it, it's helpful just to bounce things off of or kind of give some feedback. But no, he's been a huge part of our success. And, you know, we just got to, you know, have him kind of stay hot. And if we can just keep letting him see some shots that, you know, I know he's more than capable of saving than, um, you know, you, you know, anybody who can get it, catch a hot goalie going down the stretch of the MLO playoffs will be huge. And I did see that uh, one of your guys who just graduated, the great Connor Kelly, had a, was the Rookie of the Week or Player of the Week. Yeah, uh, I saw that. Yeah, he is uh, adapted quickly, but I think you knew that. All right, I mean everybody knew that. What a what a great kid, a great player he is. And again, now move to the meat of the subject, and that's the University of Maryland. First of all, congratulations on a great season. It ended a little disappointing in Maryland's eyes. But it's really funny to see these other teams when they make the Final Four. It's like total celebration, but that's not enough to, when you're a Terp, is it? No, not anymore. Uh, you know, I think in a good way, the standards kind of been been set and, and changed. Um, you know, expectations are high, but uh, again, that's kind of you know the bar that we've kind of set. And again, you know, for us getting there. I wouldn't say we're not happy about that because, again, some people never get an opportunity to, but definitely not satisfied when we reach that point. Well, let's let's talk about uh, another number one. And we, we think to Rambo, and that was Jared's first year, when it was kind of like Rambo's offense. And then last year, it certainly was Connor's offense without a question. And now the newest number one, I don't think I'm giving away any news because Coach Stillman told me himself, is going to be baby brother Jared Bernhardt. And uh, is he, do you feel that he's ready to take over that offensive role of being the leader out there? I, yeah, I do. Um, I wasn't sure, to be honest, if he was going to take number one. Um, so I'm glad I got confirmation from you. But wait a minute now. <laughs> uh, Maybe I'll spill the beans too soon. No, but... no I, you know, that, you know, it's just, uh, no, but I, I kind of had an inkling. But, uh, but no, I think it, uh, I think he's more than ready. Um, Again, uh, I have bias because one, he's a Turpin, and two, he's my brother. But uh, you know, he he does a fantastic job, and um, again, he's a tremendous athlete. And uh, you know, he puts the time in, he prepares, he you know, he trains hard during the summertime and stuff like that. So um, you know, I think he will do a, a very good job and represent that number very well. Yeah, I, I know he will because he's got the ability and he's uh, as good at Dodgers we've had for a long time. And I think when he has that role, I think he'll step up and assume that uh, kind of leadership position. But uh, talk about last year. Till's, you know, I saw it toward the end of the year and Tillman mentioned it or once or twice on TV. And that was uh, the alpha males weren't there like they were the year before. And I'm not sure what that means, you know what I mean? But certainly Cor- Curtis Corley is a crazy alpha male, all right? Yeah. And uh, I think that he'll take a big leadership role this year. And uh, where are those leaders going to come from this year from the team, in your opinion? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, in that junior class, that, you know, junior class guys who are going to be seniors, um, again, I think, you know, maybe those guys have kind of, flown under the radar a little bit just because again you know as sophomores they had the class that you know won the championship and again the Heacocks and the Rambos of the world so you know you have a very um you know uh popular class and a lot of well-known guys with good personalities and then again the guys last year you know obviously some tremendous players and Danny Morris and Kim Rotans and Connor Kelly and stuff and uh again you know so as juniors you know again just some guys who again, kind of like Curtis Corley and Nick Brzezowski, who, you know, they play just as much as a lot of the other guys, but maybe just don't catch as much, uh, you know, attention, uh, which is fine. And, and I think that's a good thing. And that's kind of just how those guys are. So, uh, again, I think we have some, some great guys that are stepping up into some leadership roles that, again, maybe don't have as much as the star power. Um, but, again, you know, you know, being a Terp, that's not what we're all about at all. So, uh, I think we have some guys that will step in and do a great job. I often brag about you to everybody that in my biased eyes, you're the best ground ball guy that I've ever seen. 
All right. And, and no, I'm, I mean it. I mean, for you are the best. And I noticed something very interesting, and I know you'll back me up on this. So at the Under Armour Games, I met this kid, Maker, M A K E R. And a, Maker, yeah. Right. And a few of the other guys. And a couple of them had like 70 ground balls their senior year. And I said, Jesse recruited them. All right. Am I right? Am I right about that? Uh, they were, I, I can't take credit for that. Those guys were, were pretty much locked up for, uh, before I got back on board. But, uh, but I do, I do appreciate a defenseman who could pick up a good ground ball. Um, so I definitely would sign my name next to some of those guys. Jesse, you were incredible in that in the uh, in the U.S. games. I mean, like the the ground balls and and look, that's the Maryland trait. All right, there's no doubt about it. The scrums are where it's at. That's what keeps Maryland in the Final Four seven years out of eight, and uh, certainly great goaltending and everything else. But uh, all right, final question: Who is? I know you're in second position right now in the with the BayHawks. Who are you likely to play in the first game? Um, that's a good question. I think there, there's actually a couple, um, teams that we could play. Uh, I'd say the most likely, um, could be the Atlanta blaze again. So we could match up with, uh, Connor Kelly again, but I think there's actually the possibility of it being Atlanta, uh, Denver, or even a possibility to New York slides in there, depending on how some other teams play out. Um, and we could match up with them. I think that would probably be, kind of the latter of, of the options. But, uh, um, again, we have opportunity to potentially play all three of those teams. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny when I watch these games. You know me pretty well. I, I can never live to root against Connor Kelly with Atlanta. Yeah. Never. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be, and I'm, that doesn't mean I'm going to root. I'm not going to root for the Bayhawks, but I hope, you know, Kelly has a big game and you still win. But uh, the Charlotte team, how in the world do they get so many Terps with Chanichuk and Dylan Motz? Oh, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's uh, you know I think once uh, once a couple teams get a hold of guys, it's it's hard to get rid of us. Um, and I mean how, you know come on, how can you how can you not lo- love yourself a, a good terp? So you know once again some guys get uh, get a few guys, they you know just they they need to go back and get some more. Well, Jesse, best of luck in the playoffs. Grab another championship, and uh, it's good to have the Bayhawks back in the playoffs. And I know you love playing for Coach Cottle. That's always got to be a thrill again for you. Oh, yeah. And uh, I can't wait for the season, although we're a long way away. So we'll let you off for the rest of the uh, for, All right. for winter ball. But thanks for coming on. And, uh, again, congrats on the USA victory. Uh, we're all very proud of you, all the Terps and the entire squad. Take care, Thank buddy. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right, Jess. All right, this is Bruce Posner. As you see, I'm talking my passion with my buddy Jesse Bernhardt. Back in a few minutes here on CBS Sports Radio 1300, we have the Maryland non-conference basketball schedule. We'll get into that, and uh, we'll have Dennis on to talk some Ravens. Welcome back to Coons Ford Terp Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. All right, back here on segment two, and I've got my good buddy on, Mr. Dennis Kalatsis. Dennis, I've got a quiz for you. You ready? Okay. I'm ready. Far uh, away. All right. Name me the 15 prospects that the Orioles got. <laughs> uh, let's see. That guy, Yusinel, and... Uh... <laughs> And uh, the guy Victor Victor. The, they may get, no, they uh, won't Victor. No. They won't Victor Victor. What do you think oh, about the wholesale move that they made? I think it's fantastic. I really do. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's what they need to do. I think it's uh, look. They're going to get into the international market stuff that we've all been talking for now for a long time. So it's about time. I applaud them for the moves. I really do. Yeah, I, and of course we had the Yankee relief pitcher pitch today for an inning. He did well, and uh, you know. They got to make a move. You could go thirty and seventy four with anybody, all right? And I agree. I agree. You just have to have to move on. Dennis, for the first time ever, I would say at least in the past ten years. I guess I used to look forward to it when I was a baby, but when when tomorrow night, I am looking forward to the exhibition game. How about you? I think the entire nation of football fans is looking forward to the football game. I think. Lamar Jackson such such a huge story, not just locally but nationally. I think a lot of people are, are going to be tuning into that game just to see what the young man can provide for the Ravens. 
does he does he start does does he start tomorrow or is RG three? You know, I don't know the sequence. I don't think Joe's going to play at all. From what I've heard, it's just going to be those two. Uh, if, if I'm the Ravens, I would start RG three and bring him in, in the second half. That's what I would do. But I have no idea what they're doing. Yeah, I would think they start RG three. Just they got to see if he's worth keeping, you know. And uh, and Lamar Jackson coming in the second quarter or the third quarter. But I can't wait to see him. I really can. I mean, I watched him in Louisville, and he was like you never wanted to turn the TV off. He's so exciting. Yeah, he's electric and dynamic. And I saw a clip of RG three uh, yesterday, and he was very well spoken. Uh, look, I think I think they have a great quarterback room, and. I think the other story is RG3 has to show well in order to keep a spot on the, ro- on the Ravens roster. I think it's a long shot that he makes it. I don't know that there's a lot of interest in him if they let him go. But, uh, look, he can make a strong case if he, if he really plays well. Yeah, there's no doubt. I don't think there's a rush to get Lamar Jackson in the in the lineup, you know, and especially with the way everybody's raving about the way Joe's playing. They look, we have to be upbeat on them. They were 8-8 eight eight last year. It wasn't like they were 2-14. and 14. They were eight and eight. So if there's, so if there's, if there's been some improvement, who knows what could happen? Well, the Ravens, they never rebuild. They always retool. And I think they've been retooling since the Super Bowl victory of, of uh, 2012. Bruce, most teams, they have some four and 12 years, some five and 11. The Ravens have been in the hunt while they've been retooling high roster. And look, the, the offense is having some success against the defense. In camp, which that hasn't happened in a few years. So Smokey Brown can be a sleeper. Crabtree fitting in. Willie Steed, the tight end. We'll see how it all comes together. But I think everybody's, you know, very optimistic. This team could very well go ten and six, get in the playoffs, and make some noise with playoff Joe. You know what? One thing that you know Brian Billick said, and is, and that is just get in the playoffs because you never know what happens from there. And certainly the Ravens won once as a wild card, and many teams have. So just get in the playoffs. But everybody's kind of like seeding the title and the division to Pittsburgh. Well, I think Pittsburgh, they have a new offensive coordinator. They have the Le'Veon Bell cloud hanging over them as a team. I think that could also be a big, big deal. I don't think their defense is that strong. Their secondary is still weak. Uh, look, I, I still think it's a two-horse race. I think it's going to come down to us and the Steelers. I don't think the bang- I think the Bengals have, have capped out with Andy Dalton and the Browns until further notice are still the Browns. They should win more than one game this season, but until they do, they you know they are what they are. They are the Browns. Uh, I don't know if you heard it the other day, but uh, somebody asked one of the guys from CNN asked LeBron if he would ever think about running for president. <laughs> How did that happen, Dennis? Well, you know anything's possible. He's definitely a charitable man. He's a philanthropist and. Look, if, if uh, you know Donald Trump can get elected, I guess that opens up the door for everybody. Right? I would want to run against. I would want to run against LeBron. <laughs> right? No, I mean Le- LeBron. You know, I like. I like. Look, he's he's by all accounts a happily married man. He's very charitable. He's very given. There's a lot to like about LeBron James. Yeah, there's no doubt. And uh, can he turn the Lakers around? Though that's the key, Dennis. Yeah, I, I look. I think he can. I think. Look, I, I think to bet against him making the playoffs this year is a big mistake, right? I think he can elevate the team. People, I'm hearing 20, 30 wins. I, I think they win 55 and get in the playoffs. He's that great of a player. There's no way that they're going to miss the playoffs in my mind. Yeah, I, I think so. And, uh, Dennis, what's up with the uh, the MMA? It's kind of been, like, quiet. Well, they've lost a lot of star power lately. I think the WWE, the professional wrestling, has taken them over. They're, they're losing some star power and... Conor McGregor, he's gotten into some trouble lately, his ego, and they, they've lost a lot of stars lately. Ronda Rousey, of course, to the WWE. And Brock Lesnar is supposed to be coming back the other direction and, and uh, has a match uh, in the UFC, but there's just not as much in the news as it used to be. No, there's they've lost, certain- they have, they, they've lost steam. They really have. They, they, there's no doubt. I remember I was coming over to your house like every third week to watch it, and now it's like uh, uh, not being talked about, you know? Yeah, they, they, lock, they lack top end star, star power. And that's a problem, you know. Only really hardcore fight fans are watching these days. But to, to be able to draw, you know, for the entire nation, they, they need the more compelling stars at, at the top. No doubt. Speak, okay. Speaking of star power, how things going at Coons Ford? I, I see uh, the inventory still stands. Do you have any more room for cars? That's the key question. Well, we, we better we better make some, Bruce, because we have a lot coming in. So you know us. So we always keep the shelves full. That puts good pressure on us to, to keep moving the inventory at, at the lowest prices in the nation. 
So it's all good stuff, uh, Coons, Baltimore, Ford. We have a lot of great stuff going for us. Right now, you can still get 0% for 72 months, plus $1,000 cash, cash back on most models. Clearing out the 2018, Bruce, 2018, 2019's already on the way, if you can believe that. That's unbelievable, Dennis. Is there any changes in the models? Any models being dropped, or is it basically the same? Basically the same, that we're going to get a new Ranger halfway through the year. Uh, modifications to a lot of vehicles, but it's an exciting time to be a Ford dealer. Our products are second to none. They're world class, and uh, they keep pushing the envelope. Bruce, we got a lot of stuff coming. The new uh, Focus Cross Tech is coming. Uh, it's going to be a real life vehicle. Yeah, uh, across the line, and of course that Echo Sports taking off. I understand. Yeah, the Echo Sports is doing real well for us. A special uh, lease deal about two fifty a month with very little down. Uh, that's really caught fire lately, and. Uh, Look, like I said, four credits supporting us, and we have the biggest uh, pre-owned inventory selection anywhere, and uh, great service parts and body shop departments, too. Yeah, I, I don't want to say that because I haven't needed to come in for a while. I don't want to, you know, I love it, but I don't need to come in, you know what I mean? That's true. Yeah, but, uh, no, the service department's the best. I've always told you that, and uh, your guys run a great show, and, of course, your daughter's a tremendous asset. Dennis? Tell us where we can find you tomorrow, and uh, I'll be on at 4.30 tomorrow. Yep, I'll be up and dial. They can, uh, anybody can Google my name, Dennis Collard says. Call me myself on 410-218-0337. Of course, as you mentioned, tomorrow we have a show up the dial. We're always one of my best guests at 4.30 p.m. Hey, Dennis, hey, Dennis. we got to hit some balls. you got to squeeze some time in for me, all right? I'm a little bit better now, so let's, all let, right. let's hit the seeds a little bit, all right, buddy? Sounds good. We'll, we'll, we'll chat after the show. All right, my friend. Take care. Thanks a lot. Be well. All right. Uh, talk about it for a second or two, because we're going to talk about Terrapin recruits in the next segment. Uh, the guys that we just got, I'm going to go over them real quick. And without getting into tremendous detail, infielder one, Carlos and Carcion. I wonder if he's related. A member of the Braves' 2016 international signing class. He becomes one of the more interesting players in the entire Orioles system in terms of his raw tools. Uh, making his debate, debut at age 20 in the South Atlantic League for Rome, that's in Georgia, this summer. And Carcion hit 288 with 10 home runs and 23 doubles. Uh, pretty impressive. He was ranked number 24 in the Brave system and was up to 14 in the MLB pipeline. Also from the Braves, catcher Brett Cumberland. Uh, the Braves took, 20, took Cumberland 23 in the supplemental second round out of Cal Berkeley where he was named Pac-12 Player of the Year. See, I love all this. I love all this, like youth and guys who can make it or maybe they won't. But when you get as many as we have, and you have that control. It's all about money, everybody. This is all about money. Because why did they let Scope go? Because Scope was going to make probably somewhere between 16 and $20 million a year. And that's not how you rebuild. You re rebuild with guys who you control the contracts of. And that's what the, the, uh, the, like, the dearth of talent in the oil system now is a plethora of talent with the addition of these 15 guys. Left-hander Bruce Zimmerman, a local guy from Loyola Blakefield, pitched for two seasons at Towson where the Braves, uh, he switched to Mount Olive and the Braves liked him enough to take him in the fifth round as a senior sign. Uh I mean, uh, it has a low 90s fastball that gets a lot of ground balls, plus a mid-70 curveball and a mid-80s changeup. Left-handers don't see him well, despite an easy traditional delivery. Uh, right, Right-hander Evan Phillips, a 23-year-old reliever who made his major league debut earlier in July for the Braves. This year, he's improved his command, walking 14 with a 1.03 whip in 40 and two-thirds innings in the International League. Fairly impressive there. Uh, from the Brewers, infielder John Villar. Now, to me, this is a guy who steps in and helps out with defense right away. When given the chance to play full-time, this is a bona fide major leaguer. He played 156 games in 2016, homering 19 times with 38 doubles and 62 steals while batting 285. He's been a bit marginalized on the emerging Braves team of late and while he was out with a thumb injury. 
uh, the Milwaukee trader for scope and Mike uh, Moustakis to take more opportunities away from him. He's 27. Uh, let me see how long. He has two more seasons of club control, which is great. Right-hander Lewis Ortiz. Orioles now have a pair of top picks from the Texas Rangers in their organization. And then from Minnesota, uh, this is the other one from, I mean, from Milwaukee is infielder John Juan uh, Gene Carmona, athletic infielder signed by the Braves out of the Dominican Republic for seven hundred twenty-five grand. Uh, batted two sixty-six over two rookie levels last year at age seventeen. Means he's only eighteen now. You know this is the way to go. This is the way the Orioles have chosen uh, their role. With that, we'll be back in a few minutes here in CBS Sports Radio thirteen hundred. This is Coons Ford Term Talk. Call 410-481-1300 now. Once again, here's Bruce Posner. All right, welcome back to segment three of Coons Ford Terp Talk. And I'm bringing in one of the young Terps right now. A great podcast on terptalk.com. One of the top in the nation. Very proud of him. And that's baby brother Mason Viner. Mason, how are you today? Good. How are you, Bruce? I listened to your last show. Very contentious between you and your brother. All right? Very contentious. Hey, it, al- it always is. Jordan's known as more the negative of the two of us. And I'm, as you know, very positive, especially about football. And very passionate about it. So, yeah, sometimes we get into it. Well, I had a few people after your uh, after the show last week text me that when you predicted 8-4 and four for the Terps, they were wondering uh, what you were thinking there. All right, but I hope it turns out to be true. All right, listen, three recruits just signed for 2019 for the Maryland football team. Uh, Let's start off with them one at a time. Let's go with Trey Rucker at first. Tell us about him. Yeah, Bruce, Trey Rucker comes out of Flint Hill, Virginia, a three-star guy. He's currently six feet tall, 190 pounds, and need to put some weight on, but you know, for the Tarps, adding those defensive backs is always important. He is the number 28 prospect in Virginia. I mean, the number 28th safety prospect in the nation and the number 89th player in the state of Virginia. Uh, okay. That takes us to Todd Simmons, right? Yes, Todd Simmons taking on a preferred walk-on spot for the Terps. He is from the Avalon School in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and quick story he was coached by Tyree Spinner who used to coach at my high school and he also coached Trayvon Diggs the younger brother of Stefan he can play almost any position he was a receiver a corner a quarterback when the team needed it so maybe something if you know Max Bortenschlager situation happens again maybe we got another guy in Todd Simmons hey you know speaking of Stefan Diggs five years 37 million extension that's not too bad for uh, Stefan it's five years, $40 million guaranteed, and the contract can range up to, I believe, $81 million. I, I was talking guaranteed money, so it's $40 million guaranteed. That's all I look at is guaranteed because the rest is a crapshoot. But that's unbelievable. Yeah. That is absolutely unbelievable. And, uh, you know, well done, Stefan. All right. I remember the day when he committed. You remember that? He was at Looney's, you know, singing the fight song. Yeah, yeah, I remember. I was... I mean, that's almost, what, coming up on six years ago, five years ago now? Yeah, but it was really a big get. It really, really was. I mean, it was uh, huge for Maryland, and he certainly played that way when he was, uh, when he was at Maryland. Uh, and the third, uh, Todd Simmons. No, we said that one. Who's the third one? Rucker? Yeah. Jordan Houston. The Jordan Houston, also, right. Also from Flint Hill in Virginia, just like Trey Rucker. Coming into College Park as the number eight all-purpose back in the country. That's a receiver-running back hybrid. The number 18th prospect in the state of Virginia. He received some big-time offers. Virginia Tech, Michigan, Michigan State, North Carolina. He's definitely one of the best out of the group. He was the only junior in the DMV, the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, to be named All-Met as a junior by the Washington Post. Is he considered a four-star? No, but, you know, with another season to play, he can definitely make it up to a four-star. So we know that in this upcoming year that DJ got his share of four-stars. There's no doubt about it. But as we go no. into... What's that? No. 
Well, yeah, you're talking about last year and the year before. His first two classes were full of four and some even ranked five-star guys. Right. How about for 18, the class that's coming in now? The class of 2019, Bruce, because they will sign in February, isn't looking too great. It, after this past weekend, it came up 10 spots in the rankings to 56, where it is ranked 13th out of the 14 Big Ten teams. It has not picked up a four-star yet, but it is looking hot on some guys. Like Anthony Wigan, he is a four-star offensive lineman from Lackawanna Community College, originally from the great state of Maryland. But they're talking Penn State with them now. So, Bruce, I don't know where these four stars are going to come from. How about 2018? What is the class ranked? Our 2018 class was top 30 and it was ranked fourth in our side of the conference and I believe sixth or seventh overall. Well, that's pretty good for Maryland, correct? Yeah, that's great. First ever back-to-back top 30 classes under Durkin. But when you're bringing in massive classes, eventually it will stop. You know, their line was, come here, play now. With all these four-star guys and three-star guys developing in the program, that might not be so true anymore. So recruiting for DJ and the group has gotten a lot tougher. Yeah, but, you know, that never stops the great schools. I think it's more about winning than anything else. All right? Yeah, and we, well, we'll get to see that, and I hope that's coming this year. Some basketball news came out today, Bruce. I'm not sure if you heard. Go ahead. Sam Kufnell who played at Arizona State in Kansas, was the number 38th player in the country. Now looking again to transfer, he's looking at Maryland. So he's been to, he started at Arizona State, then went to Kansas? Yes, he has three years of eligibility left. And really, he didn't get on the court much this year. He said originally that he was looking to go back to the state of Washington, but at this point he has not picked up an offer from Washington State or Washington, and Maryland's creeping in, might be able to land him. Yeah, but if he's not good enough at Arizona, if he's not good enough at Kansas, what you know, is he good? Bruce, uh, they say they haven't really found the right fit for him yet. That really nice home feeling that Maryland is kind of one of the schools that's known for making a place feel like your home. So I think it will work out here, you know, a guy who's a top 40 player out of a class, is really worth taking a chance on if you have that extra spot. Well, one thing we know is that Anthony Cowan's been shining in the uh, the Kenner League, is it, in D.C.? Yes, the Kenner League. Yeah, I read that, and uh, it's a good sign for him. This is a great opportunity for him because it's, you know, it's clearly his show right now, and, of course, we don't know about how Wiggins is going to adapt. But uh, Wiggins probably makes the starting lineup, correct? Yeah, Bruce, I'm thinking... Uh, Anthony Cowan, Aaron Wiggins, Daryl Morsell, and then down low, I'm going to go with Fernando and Jalen Smith. That's kind of an obvious pair. Yeah, it's, I, I tell you what, it's enough to make me really look forward to it. I mean, really. And, of course, they came out with their non-conference schedule, I think it was today. And, uh, yeah, it was. Not bad. I mean, you got a game at Navy, which I look forward to. That's always fun. Uh, you got Hofstra at home, Virginia at home. I mean, Virginia's going to be a top-five school this year, I assume. And then uh, the surprise on the schedule was December the 8th, uh, Loyola Chicago in Baltimore. Always good to get back to Baltimore. But, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how many guys they lost from last year, but it should be certainly uh, a, a marquee matchup for that day. And yeah, I just, the, the I, go, go ahead. Playing Loyola Chicago, of course, getting back to Baltimore in the Royal Farms Arena. But for this schedule, you know, I would love to see some more bigger games in College Park. But, you know, Mark Turgeon likes the schedule like this one, just one or two tough games, and hopefully we'll get a win out of that and something to show to that tournament committee, hopefully in March. Well, you got five teams that advance to the NCAA tournament, okay, in, in, in this group. Seton Hall, that's a home game. That's a surprise, too. I don't know much about them. They weren't too strong last year, I don't think. But uh, you never know. So Maryland has not is not playing in the Gavit games. No, the Terps will not be participating in the Gavit games this year. Well, I wonder why. Well, it is a rotating schedule. Not every team is really involved in it. 
And I guess for Maryland, it was their turn to step out. But I'm sure they'll be back if the games continue. I would have loved to see him play uh, Villanova. Love to. All right? I don't care where. I just think that uh, we've talked about this many times. So, uh, of course, then you have now this year, you only have 11 of those. And now this year, you have 20 conference games. 20. That's almost unbelievable, isn't it, uh, Mason? Uh, to me, it is. Because, you know, when I was growing up, those early teams, you know, 2010, 2009, they were playing, what, 14 conference games? 14. And that was a lot. So, and then it, it went to 16. Yeah, I'm here. It went to 16. But, uh, you know, 20 is a lot. I mean, you're not well, going to talk about too much of an unbalanced schedule because there's just not a call for it anymore. Yeah, I, I'm not a huge fan of it. I don't know. Well, we haven't really gotten to talk about this because it's only starting to come up now that you see 11 non-conference games. But I'm not a huge fan of it. But the Big Ten wants to give it a try. They want to be on the forefront of extending the conference schedule. So they're going to give it a few years or a year to test it, see what the team's like, and they'll make a decision after that. Yeah, I was, uh, you know, we'll see how it works. A lot, you know, I know Turge is not happy about it. I don't think Izzo is either. It's just these conference games are so tough. They're so physical that uh, they can take a lot out of you and they have to play 20 of them. And then from that, you go right into the tournament. It's like you almost have no time to breathe. Yeah, I mean, it's it's going to be a gauntlet, and it's going to give Maryland a lot of chances with uh, looking at a deep roster this season to win some games, to be able to play a lot of guys. You know, suddenly having depth becomes almost the number one thing that you have to look for, a star player that can produce and depth after that. Question for you, number one in the country preseason college, Alabama or Clemson, who is it? For me, I'm going to pick Alabama. And the quarterback says it all. You know, two is expected to step up. And if he doesn't, then they can always go back to Jalen Hurt. The running backs, of course, are always going to be great. Those lines are going to be tough. They're just, every year, bring out a new set of players that have been waiting, foaming at the mouth to see real game time football. And they come out every year and they're just tougher. They're faster. They're bigger. Alabama, to me, is just the premier college football program. Trayvon Diggs, is he still going to be just a punt returner? Are we going to see him at receiver? I think you're going to see him. He has been on that defensive side of the ball for the Crimson Tide. He's going to play this year. It's that junior year. It's that time where it's time to step up and you know become a man there and be a guy, one of the guys, of course, in that Alabama defensive backfield. But if he doesn't produce, you know the story about these big schools. He'll be sitting back on the bench. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. Uh, I don't know if anybody's been watching. I don't know if you have, Mason, but this documentary on Baker Mayfield. Have you seen any of that on Fox Sports? No, I have not seen Fantastic. Baker Mayfield. Fantastic. Fantastic story about yeah, him. Yeah, there seem to be, you know, as sports team continues to progress, there seem to be these documentaries that are just great. My favorite out of them is Last Chance You, the Netflix one. That was great. But this one, Baker Mayfield, like, he, can you imagine? He was barely recruited in high school, and he went to TCU as a walk-on. Ironically, wound up starting his first game, won his first four games, and they got hurt. And then they didn't offer him a scholarship for the second year. So he just went to, yeah, o- Bruce, he went to Oklahoma and walked He Texas Tech, not TCU. Texas Tech. No, was it Texas Tech? Correct. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Incredible story, though. Incredible story. And you know, to that to be the number one pick in the country, it's only just started. You're a couple episodes behind, but it really is fascinating. With that, we are out of time. Mason, thanks a lot for coming on. And uh, that will do it for today. It's Bruce Posner. Again, I'm high on the Orioles move. Very, very, very positive. And what was his name? John Carroll from the Yankees pitched today. Cody Carroll, yes. Cody Carroll, better name than John. Cody Carroll from the Yankees pitch that we got him in the trade, went one scoreless inning, gave up a double to uh, Giancarlo Stanton. All right, with that, we're heading out. We'll see you Saturday on the Sports Maven, talk a lot more about the future of the Orioles and reviewing uh, Lamar Jackson's first performance for the Ravens. Uh, Drive safely, everyone. See you Saturday.